Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question and answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions. Your questions in the question and answer window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, William Rushton from BioRed Laboratories. Thank you, Leah. Today I will be talking about assessing viral clearance and early phase process development. I'd like to begin doing an overview of uh, impurity profile and downstream processing. So you'll have your product related impurities. There'll be aggregates and fragments, charge variants, and post-translational modifications, as well as process related impurities, uh, host cell proteins, host cell DNA, RNA, if you're using a protein A capture with a MAB, you'll have fragments of recombinant protein A, endotoxins, and viruses. For most of these, uh, the work will be done in your PD lab, uh, but viruses typically will be done at a CRO. For this study, we worked with a company named Texel, although there have been some larger pharma companies that will do in-house viral clearance studies. And also, just to note, viral clearance studies are typically performed after the process has been stabilized or locked down. So some of the milestones during biopharmaceutical development. Early on, you have your IND submission, and there you're going to be looking at relevant or specific viruses, uh, typically at least two. Uh, for CHO cell, you'll look at XMULV and MVM. Uh, you could be looking at more uh, depending on your cell lines. There you're assessing the clearance potential of the process. As you get into your later stage development, you're going to be then looking at more at nonspecific model viruses, usually at least four, depending on the cell line could be more. And here you're looking at the clearance robustness of the process. So the timeline shown here, during all these phases, you're going to have some process development, process characterization, process validation, and then as you get further along, you're going to be process improvements, you're going to have your scale up, and then your transfer to your CMO or your manufacturing suites. So during the early portions with the development, characterization, and validation, you're going to be looking at your locked process and see if it's meeting the log reduction value target. As you go further along with your improvements, scale ups, and transfers, you want to be determining whether you're maintaining the LRV from your early phase work or even potentially improving it. So we had four main objectives for this case study. The first was to evaluate the effects of critical process parameters, specifically clearance of process and product related impurities, as well as recovery of target drug molecule. Secondly was to assess the design space and optimal process condition. Next was to use a pragmatic strategy to ensure viral safety and downstream processing. And finally, we wanted to evaluate typical conditions for three resins. Nuvia A'4A, which is a mixed mode resin that is anion exchange and hydrophobic interaction. Nuvia HRS, which is a high resolution cation exchanger. And CHTXT, which is also a mixed mode, but this mixed mode is calcium affinity and cation exchange. So next up would be selection of the model viruses. So why MVM? So here you see a table of the four viruses that are typically used in later stage viral clearance studies. They cover both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, as well as DNA and RNA. They cover a range of sizes, uh, four different virus families, and they also have varying levels of physiochemical resistance. MVM has been considered the worst case model and for several reasons. First, there have been known cases of contamination in bioreactors, so it leads to relevance of this virus. Two, it's very stable, so it is resistant to chemical inactivation. Since it does have a small particle size, uh, as the table indicates, between 18 and 24 nanometers, it is roughly the size of common biologics. And also, similar to biopharmaceuticals, the capsid proteins on the surface will lead to it interacting similarly on some resins as biopharmaceuticals. So this is the experimental study that was used. 
We have a test article that had a PI of approximately nine. We spiked in a known amount of MVM. The sample were incubated in a spin column with the resin, and then the effluent was collected, and the assay was performed to determine residual MVM titer, as well as calculate the LRV. Per the ICH Q5A guidelines, the amount of virus eliminated or inactivated by the production process should be compared to the amount of virus which may be present in unprocessed bulk. There is a fairly lengthy calculation used to determine this value, so I would recommend that you speak with your CRO that you are working with to determine the appropriate amount of clearance that you are required to uh, achieve. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nuvia A-Prime 4A. It is a mixed mode hydrophobic interaction anion exchanger. So here you're seeing in the situation, say, of pH of 7 to 8, your basic species will be positively charged. And since this will also result in the positive charge of the ligand, you will see electrostatic repulsion. So if you have any high PA target proteins or positively charged host cell proteins, those will be... Uh, in the flow through. Conversely, if you have acidic species, they will be negatively charged, so they will bind to the ligand. So if you have a low PI target protein, host cell proteins, host cell nucleic acids, endotoxins, and viruses. This is just to show that you can perform the chromatography in either flow through or bind and elute, depending on the PI of your target molecule. Uh, you can then leverage your buffer pH and conductivity to impact the charge and hydrophobic interactions, which will allow you to be more selective and recover your target molecule by fine-tuning these uh, pH and salt concentrations. Now I'm going to discuss some of the critical process parameters that were chosen for this study. As I mentioned in the slide previously, due to the PI of the target molecule being nine, uh, we're going to be operating in a flow through mode. Some of the considerations in the process design will be the purity of the drug, the yield of the drug product, as well as the process productivity. Buffer composition, both the pH and the salt concentration will have an impact on your purity and yield, while residence time, which is your linear flow rate and the load level of feed stream will have an impact on the yield of the drug product as well as process productivity. Down at the bottom, you'll see a contour plot that was done between pH 6 and 8 and 0, 150 millimolar salt. And it shows that the binding capacity, even at best, is still going to be roughly less than 25 mg per mil. So based on this result, flow through should be used for this process. Here's a table of the DOE that was performed using the spin columns. So it was a full factorial four parameter with two levels. See the four parameters studied were buffer pH, salt concentration of the buffer, the residence time, and the load level onto the column. The responses were impurity content, which were the MVM itself, HCPs, DNA, endotoxins, and product aggregate content. Additionally, product recovery. As I mentioned before, the test format was in spin columns using 100 microliters of resin. Just showing here runs 7 and 17. These were center points used um, in the DOE as well. Now I'm going to be discussing the results of the spin column experiments. Here you have the MVM clearance map, and it is showing from pH 6 to 8 and 0 to 150 millimolar salt. As MVM is a capsid protein with a PI of 6.1 to 6.2, the pH greater than pi should leave a net negative charge on the surface. The contour plot shows that the upper right quadrant of higher pH and higher salt leads to larger MVM LRV. So concluding that MVM is more effectively retained by Nuvia A prime 4A at higher pH and salt concentration. Now that we have the MVM clearance map, we wanted to verify the results of the DOE using packed columns. This is just showing the results from the four parameters tested. 
pH and salt concentration showed significance as far as NVM removal. Residence time did not, and load ratio did show a slight increase as you loaded towards the higher end of the load ratio. The runs were performed using our 5 ml foresight columns, using a residence time of 5 minutes, a load level of 50 to 55 mg per mil, and a total amount of MVM of 7.5 logs. At the table, you will see the conditions for MVM that were tested and for one run with XMULV. The 10 millimolar phosphate, 150 millimolar salt pH 8 gave greater than 4.2 logs of clearance. The 200 millimolar salt gave greater than 4.5 logs of clearance. And the 10 millimolar pH 6 with no salt gave 2.23 logs. This was included as a bit of a negative control to show that the heat map uh, did show the proper trend results. For the XMULV, one condition was tested, the 150 millimolar salt, and we got greater than 5.02 logs. So the next portion of the study was to evaluate Nuvia HRS and CHTXT. Here we have the same test article with PI of about 9, and we had MVM and XMULV spiked into separate runs. The sample was loaded onto the column, and it was eluted in a bind and elute mode. The product fraction was then collected, and the assays for residual MVM and XMULV titer were done and then the LRV was calculated. So here we have the chromatogram and operating conditions for the Nuvia HRS XMULV study. The pH chosen was pH 5, which is a typical operating condition for a cation exchanger. So it was 20 millimolar acetate, 25 millimolar salt pH 5. The product was eluted using a 0 to 100% B gradient over 10 CVs with a 20 millimolar acetate 500 millimolar salt pH 5. At the end, there was a high salt hold to ensure that we got all the product off. And the flow rate for this step was 300 centimeters an hour to show that you could get high throughput through the column. Uh, the blue peak symbolizes the elution off of the column. Next, we have the CHT XT media XMULV chromatogram. CHT is a Mixed mode, as I mentioned previously, it's uh, calcium affinity and cation exchange. So here the conditions are typical for CHT, 5 millimolar sodium phosphate, 20 millimolar salt, pH 6.5. The product was eluted using a 0 to 100% B gradient with 5 millimolar sodium phosphate, 1 molar salt, pH 6.5 over 10 CVs. As with the HRS, a high salt hold was done to ensure that we got all the product off of the column. And as with HRS, it was run at 300 centimeters an hour. Here are the results of the XMULV study for both Nuvia HRS and CHTXT. For Nuvia HRS, a total of 6.26 logs were loaded onto the column and the product fraction had 2.5 logs. This resulted in a LRV of 3.76. For cation exchangers, this is actually a pretty good clearance as most cation exchange steps will get between one to two, maybe two and a half logs. So we were very happy to see 3.76 logs clearance. For the CHTXT, the total loaded on was 6.86 logs. There was none detected in the product fraction, so less than two logs for an LRV of greater than 4.86. For both MVM experiments showed very limited reduction, less than one LRV in the product fractions. So to summarize, uh, DOE has been used to conduct a scale down study on MVM clearance capacity of Nuvia A'4A resin. This was primarily to evaluate the interactions between MVM and the resin. And as the contour plot results showed, the higher salt and higher pH gave selective binding of the MVM uh, to allow for acceptable viral clearance. Next, viral clearance studies at early stage can assist in defining the design space of a process step that targets product recovery and impurity removal. Um, by anticipating where the MVM and MULV clearances can be, if your process changes or your parameters are adjusted, you're able to have an idea of what your clearances might be 
before you actually go to do those studies. Next, Nuvia HRS and CHC XT case studies did demonstrate favorable log reductions for XMULV in bind and elute operations. I will note that all the runs had undetectable virus in the flow through fractions, so it could be possible to develop a flow through mode that would allow for acceptable viral clearance. And then finally, partnering with the viral clearance vendor or CRO is a valuable resource. We found that working with Texel during this study was very good for us. We learned a lot about viruses and they were able to uh, evaluate some of our resins. Finally, I'd like to end with some process chromatography resources within BioRad. We are able to work with method development. We have active on-site support that we can leverage a global network of experts. I am part of a team of process chromatography scientists that work in the field. I cover North America, but I have colleagues that are located throughout the globe that can also perform on-site support. Additionally, we can do process development with our team of scientists in Hercules, uh, which is our corporate headquarters that can also assist with your development. As I mentioned, we are a global company. So if you are doing work in one area of the country or world and you go to another area, we're able to support you seamlessly. If you need to request samples or wish to contact your process specialist, please use the addresses listed at the bottom of this screen. I wanna thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, so the first question is, how applicable are these design of experiment results to actual viral clearance studies? Um, based on the results that we saw, the DOE results corroborated very well to when we did the uh, scale-up runs with the pre-packed columns. So I think that um, if you're able to do these DOEs, you can do them with a small amount of sample. Um, you might not necessarily need to check as many conditions, uh, but I do think it will help you um, feel comfortable that when you do your actual packed column runs that you're going to get the viral clearance that you're expecting. Okay. And is it necessary to do preliminary testing before the, a viral clearance study? It, it isn't necessary specifically. Um, I know a lot of places, if you've run, you know, clearance study before, a lot of people might have an idea. Um, if you can test before, it's, it is useful. Um, However, doing a DOE with, you know, 18 samples there like that, it, th there is a cost associated with it. So um, I think in the situation that maybe it's a brand new process, you have no idea, you have no historical use of, say, a resin and how it's going to react, I think it would definitely be good to do a preliminary study. Okay, great. So it looks like we've run out of time. We have time for just one more question. If you haven't uh, typed your question in, go ahead and do that now. We'll be able to pass any questions that we don't get to directly on, and you'll be followed up with directly. So the last question for now is, did this study use new or reused chromatography? Uh, for these studies, we used uh, fresh resin. Um, the prepack columns had never been used before and the resin for the DOE was also new resin. Um, this is fairly common for early phase studies, um, but as you get later into your development and into your lifetime validations, you will actually see um, studies involving used resin. Um, I can say in my prior lifetime, I actually uh, did quite a number of old versus new resin studies uh, to compare viral clearances, and we did find in some cases that as the resin aged, uh, you did see a reduction in your uh, viral clearance, so we did have to adjust um, our lifetimes based on viral clearance studies. Okay, great. Thanks, William. No problem. Thank you, Leah. 
And thank you to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.